basically to talk about our solution to um, the steel industry. Uh, some of you know the steel industry accounts for 9% of global CO2, and that problem only gets worse as demand rises. Demand will rise from 2 billion tons to over 3 billion tons as countries like India, Indonesia, and so on urbanize. So the emissions from steel will only keep going up unless there is a solution. And uh, so that's defining the need, and here we'll talk about our opportunity. So before I do, just quickly, in terms of giving an impression of uh, who we are, we are the GFG Alliance, which includes Liberty Steel. Liberty Steel is one of the top 10 producers of steel in the world. We have over 200 locations globally, operating in over 30 countries. But we also have probably the biggest and the best magnetite resource in the world, which is in South Australia, in Wyala. And that's where the need, our need, for example, our plants across the world need to decarbonize. And the solution for that is, is green iron, which is what we can do in Wyala in South Australia. In South Australia, we have not only the biggest magnetite resource, but also probably the best combination of wind and solar anywhere in the world. For about 70% of the time, almost 18 hours, sorry, almost 14 hours a day, we have uh, availability of solar and wind, which means that we can have a good load factor to make green hydrogen. And that green hydrogen, again, is critical in terms of our journey, but again, important to understand because it's not something which can be transported very easily, but we don't need to because we can consume it immediately to make green iron. So this is basically, in a nutshell, the plan. We have a need. We have a need to produce green iron and green steel globally. We have uh, a mining resource which is required for this process. You cannot make green iron from the traditional iron ore mining methodology, which makes hematite, so most of Pilbara is uh, hematite that doesn't work for a green iron, but magnetite works, magnetite is needed, and Wyala has the best and the biggest resource for magnetite, which is only 50 kilometers from our own deep sea port. So it's not something which can be done tomorrow, it's something which can be done today. In fact, we have been mining magnetite already for the last 17 years uh, in Wyala 4, currently serving our blast furnace, so we're gonna repurpose that to make it serve our requirements for green iron and green steel. We expand that, in terms of a mining operation. At the same time, we expand our renewables, and my team will talk about uh, those plans in a bit more detail in a minute. And we expand the production of green hydrogen. Again, some of you would have heard South Australia's commitment to build the world's largest electrolyzer, 250 megawatts, which is bigger than anybody else um, on the map at the moment. That will feed our green iron production, and that green iron will then be shipped to our, to our steel plants around the world, all of which are being converted to electric arc furnaces. Steel was traditionally made in a blast furnace, which is coal-based. An electric arc furnace is basically a melting furnace, which melts scrap and melts uh, green iron. We need that, of course, in Australia, but much more in much vast, much bigger quantities. We need it all across the, the world. So we have the mining resource. We have the clean energy resource. We have our own plants already across the world, which are in the process of all being converted to electric furnaces, which will be customer ready, if you like. So this is basically the triangle of our opportunity. Thank you. I'll hand over to my team now. Thanks. Thank you, um, Sanjeev. Um, so what, what I would like to um, just talk about is the unique opportunity that we have in Wyala. So I think Sanjeev has indicated that GFG is a, is a global business with uh, close to 20 million tons of capacity across the globe. Um, and it is our intention to actually decarbonize uh, all of those uh, facilities and actually lead the charge in terms of the transformation of the steel industry from a, from a very highly intensive uh, emission um, uh, industry to a, to a green sustainable industry. The, the benefit that we have is we've got Wyala in the portfolio. And what, what is it that makes Wyala unique uh, other than the fact that I've lived there for 16 years and I love the community. But Wyala has got, uh, as Sanjeev has indicated, from a renewable uh, a source, it's got a very unique um, uh, uh, capability. The combination between wind power and solar power actually gives you a capacity utilization factor deep into the 50%, which is unique even if you try and compare that to other facilities or other locations worldwide. I mean, to have wind and solar combining in that way 
and give you 58% of the time energy to drive your processes is, is definitely unique. On top of that, we also have this unique resource that Sanjeev has mentioned. Uh, we've got an enormous amount of magnetite um, that was basically exposed over the last 120 years. Typically what you find with magnetite is magnetite sits much deeper than hematite. Uh, and therefore you have to actually dig very deep to get to the magnetite. The benefit that we have is that for the last 120 years, that hematite has been, uh, uh, has been taken out and obviously has been sold, so it's uh, it made, made Wyala what it is today. But it's now at a point where we're actually at the level where we can start uh, uh, mining the, the magnetite. So we've got more than four billion tons of this magnetite that sits there. The uniqueness of the magnetite is that other than iron, oxygen, and a bit of silica, there's nothing else in it. And so if you want the perfect feed source for green iron, then it has to be this. So we take the magnetite out of the, out of the ground, we then process it. We process it into a product that gives us 70% iron, and the rest of it is a little bit of silica and a little bit of, uh, of oxygen that needs to be removed. So again, a very unique uh, resource that we have. On top of that, we've got a deep sea capable port. Again, a fairly unique um, combination uh, of factors. Um, in the port, we've got the capability to export up to 20 million tons. Um, so this is, a, this is a port that we own um, that we operate, uh, and it's been part of the business for a long time. We also have the rail infrastructure combining or connecting the, um, the mine with, uh, with the steelworks, uh, and also connecting the steelworks with the rest of Australia. So very well established infrastructure. Wyala is definitely not short on land, that's for sure. Um, so there's a lot of land available. Uh, so as we start sort of transforming this facility, then we will need a lot of land for solar, for wind, for, for all of the processing facilities that we need. And that is available in, a, in an abundance. Um, I think the other thing that we shouldn't underestimate is that we've got a com community there that's been involved in mining and steel works for many, many years. As I said, we've been mining there for 120 years and we've been making steel there for 60 years. So this is a community that understands how to mine, and it's a community that understands how to process and make steel. So if you take all of this, and then you add the one very interesting aspect, is you look at our stakeholders and the support that we get from our stakeholders. If you think about what the South Australian government is doing in terms of the hydrogen um, electrolyzer and the power plant that they're installing, and they're doing that in Wyala. So this is that unique opportunity where we say, but hydrogen becomes a very important part of our transformation. And we find that the South Australian government is, uh, is very proactive in supporting the hydrogen economy. Um, and we also have all the federal support from uh, safeguard mechanism, from Head Start programs. So there's a lot of support. So a lot of positive um, support that we get from our, from our stakeholders. So this all actually, I reckon, puts YLI in this very unique opportunity. And I think, in fact, if you have to try and find anywhere else in the world where you, you get this combination uh, of factors supporting this transition, I don't think you're going to you find it very hard to find something similar. So if I just quickly talk through, um, and sorry, I'm, I'm sort of the, the technical guy, so I, I'm trying, I'll try and make it not too boring, but um, uh, Stefan is the guy that brings all the energy, so he'll, he'll follow after this. But from a, from a process flow chart point of view, what we do is, we, it all starts with a mine. So I've spoken about the fact that in the mine, we've got this unique resource, we will develop that resource, uh, we will then produce a product that we call magnetite concentrate, that magnetite concentrate is actually a saleable product. That's the interesting thing. So from a, from a supply chain, if you look at, at, the, at the process, you will find that all the products that we make is actually a saleable product. So you're not forced to push this through the chain. You can actually sell it. So magnetite is, is, will be a very highly valued product in the, in the industry going forward. But in our flowchart, what we do is we take that concentrate and we turn it into a pellet. 
that pellet uh, is then ready to go into the DRI units. Now again, the, the pellet is a product that you can sell on the market. Again, a saleable product. But in our case, we will put it into those DRI units. Um, and the DRI units are actually the units that will consume a lot of the, the energy. So this is where we use hydrogen as a gas. We can use natural gas as the transition. Um, but this is, this is the real energy hungry units. Um, and so uh, in, in our case, uh, Stefan will talk about that, but we will start these units on natural gas. They're very expensive units, capital intensive. So you need to de-risk those projects, and the easy way to de-risk those projects is you, you start them up with natural gas. Um, there's, there's a lot of these units running today worldwide uh, based on natural gas, so it's proven technology. What is not proven is to actually change that natural gas to hydrogen. That's not proven, but that you can do systematically. As the hydrogen becomes available, the hydrogen can actually start replacing the, the natural gas. Uh, and hopefully then you get to a point where you basically fill this thing with only hydrogen at some point. That will give you then the, the green iron. But we also have the capability, especially in Wyala, where we actually produce all of the structural products and royal products for Australia. We also have the ability to take that DRI and then put it through an arc furnace, where we then actually produce the steel, and that steel then gets rolled into the pr product products that will then be used for, for all of the construction and development that needs to, uh, needs to still take place in, in Australia. It's only the only domestic supplier of structural product and, and rail, uh, rail products. So, so for us, the benefit of this system is that, firstly, we can actually produce a product that is saleable from pit straight down to the, to the, to the steel. For us, the DRI uh, that we produce, you can see that we will, each of those units that we've got there will be producing 2.5 million tons of DRI. That's a lot more than what we would need for steel but we've got the ability to take that product and then export that to some of our other facilities or some of our other partners. So this is the benefit of how we've actually uh, designed the process flow. Now, I, just, I think this is just a slide indicating the, the, the logistics and the mine uh, activities. You can see that we've indicated there that that sort of long strip, about 10 kilometers wide and about 50 kilometers long, that's where all of the, of the magnetite resource sits. And there's different pits uh, that will be developed that actually gives us the ability also to actually diversify the processes. Uh, so you can actually develop all of them separately or you can, you can develop them simultaneously. That's the benefit. And you can see that we've got um, a 50 kilometer distance. That distance from the mine to the port, even in today globally, if you try and find something that's similar than that, will be unique. Just that closeness uh, and the proximity to the, to, the, to the port is in itself unique. And then on top of it, as I said, we've also got the, um, the rail infrastructure, the pipelines uh, to actually feed the slurries. All of that is already existing infrastructure that, that exists there. So a really, truly unique opportunity. So what I'll do is uh, I'll hand over to Stefan now, but just while I'm sort of handing over, we, um, we would like to just, I'm not sure whether we're going to see this one work. Uh, okay, right, so maybe this is, this is just a video on the mine. Um, okay, so I think what you can see is that um, that we've got the, um, the mining activities, a lot of this is actually showing the what the mine looks like. Um, you can clearly see that it's a mine that's been mined for the last 120 years. Um, it's a, an activity, so we've been mining magnetite there since 2006. So we've got already about um, 14, 16 years of magnetite uh, experience. This pit that we see here specifically is the magnetite, magnetite pit. You can see that if you look at the layers, hematite is, is red, magnetite is black. So you can see that the slides from the top, you can see that there was a lot of hematite that we had to sort of get, get through before we actually get to the, to the black, black gold uh, that sits at the bottom. Uh, this is all, all of our, all of this uh, as existing uh, activities, existing facilities, uh, and again, just demonstrating that the capability is there. It's, uh, it's not new capability that, we, um, that we're establishing. In the process of changing this to the bigger magnetite facilities, 
Some of these equipment will be replaced with much bigger equipment. Currently, we're mining about 2.5 million tons of mag magnetite and about 9 million tons of hematite. The hematite will be finished at some point, and then we will turn this to completely magnetite. And the magnetite will go to 7.5 and then to 15 million tons and then up to, up to 30 million tons. Some of this, the stuff we see here is the processing facility. So typically in a mine, what you see is you just see the dig and shovel and, and, and shift. Uh, in this case, you can see that there's a fair amount of processing that has to be uh, taken or done on the, on the process. When we start with a product that's only got about 38% FE in it, and when we finish this product as the magnetite concentrate, that then sits at about 70%, uh, which is then perfect for, uh, for putting into the next processes. Right, so I think that's, that's it. So over to Stefan. Thank you, teens. I, I think it's so important to acknowledge this growth. This growth comes back to one of the biggest challenges we have globally, just repeating what Sanjeev told earlier, about 8% of the carbon emissions from our all global emissions are coming from the steel sector. And what then Teens explained is actually a super credible and very hands-on way of solving the problem, reducing our emissions. But then it comes back to the challenge of energy. Only two minutes of solar radiation to our planet would be sufficient to cover all energy usage on, on Earth completely. So it is not news, but it is truly the untapped resource for us to drive the sustainability transition. And when considering these global industrial processes and how to actually truly decarbonize, we need first to start looking at where do we start? And Australia is really one of the most exciting places on Earth due to the fact that the solar radiation is so superior compared to many other places in the world. It needs to be taken into account when looking circularity looking resource-wise of how to truly transform our industry into becoming green. And in the lower part of the South Australia is where we have a very strong solar radiation, where the opportunity to actually accelerate our green transition journey is now being transformed into practice. We are, after a number of years, developing a PV plant linking into our activity I say activity because, like Tim said, it's, it's mining, it's iron making, it's steel making, it's a whole value chain. And green electrons is needed in all areas. In some areas to produce hydrogen with electrolyzers, but starting then with the green electrons. So we are in the final phases of now putting the shovel to the ground and really building a 280 megawatt PV farm, Coltana, outside Wyala in Adelaide. It is going to drive a lot of things forward. It's showing the footprint, how we take the first step, and together with the South Australian government, building 250 megawatt electrolyzers, we have a foundation to truly start what I call, what we call the industrial symbiosis, an ecosystem that is one of the first in the world to drive the transition for the green steel revolution. It is about the green steel revolution and really joining that journey. What is particularly exciting is that the four billion ton of magnetite resource, and there's more to come in this geography, is that it contains the 70% of magnetite, which is so clean and exciting out of an energy perspective is that it needs less energy to actually be transformed then into green iron and then later into green steel. <coughs> and this prerequisites, together with the local prerequisites for green electrons production, is what makes this place unique. And this is what we're now going to transform going forward. There are some key numbers that we need to take into, into account. The almost 700,000 solar panels. There's actually a little bit more than the 630 we're doing in this first area. It, it's a lot. It, it's, it's going to cover almost 300 hectare ground. 
And also indicated before, land use is very important to prerequisites to be able to drive this going forward. There are more things coming. There's not only the PV. It was also described before the combination of PV and wind is actually unique because you get up the utilizations to over 50%. Now this is so crucial in order to be able to say that we are doing the most out of the natural resources available. There is a lot of wind exploitations now being planned west of Adelaide. We're talking about two to three gigawatt before 2028, if now in application phase. There's further hydrogen uh, uh, development ongoing, and there is an announced hydrogen corridor. And together with a lot of different interested parties, is now attracting uh, ecosystems where we can attract capital into Australia to truly make Australia the superpower, the nation, one of the three nations that is going to be this renewable superpower and create an edge of how we can drive industrial processes going forward. Hydrogen. Hydrogen is super critical. It's critical for us going forward in the sense of you need it, you need support to get going because it is still expensive to do it. It's one of the most common products in the world, but then it is being produced by fossil resources. To produce green hydrogen out of the green electrons, you need electrolyzers, there are different technologies, you need to try it, and you need to pilot it, and you need to industrialize it and scale it. First, when it gets into the scaling mode, you remove a lot of the cost following the PV panel cost development and take the same development for hydrogen. It is not far away. We cannot be discouraged that it's not commercially viable today on just starting point. So together with the Australian government and seeing the subsidies, seeing the, the hubs of hydrogen being developed, it is crucial to really land the step forward where we can start industrializing the hydrogen development and really taking it into the industrial processes. So the combination of PV and wind, making electrolyzers, together with batteries, creating storages, we really do have the right prerequisites to do what we think we're going to be the first of its kind, true green steel making that has not only a national impact, but a global impact. Because it's going to take us in to how we actually take do steel making. In the end, mining, iron making, it is about doing this. The steel making with green electrons coming from wind and PV, with the hydrogen, we can really do that. However, to do that, you also need a lot of capital. You need a lot of trust. You need a lot of partnerships. With that, I hand over to you, Paul. Thank you, Stefan. Just to, just to put it in context and just to remind everybody, we talk about what we're, we're talking about here. But if you just stop for a moment, 90% of world steelmaking is coal-based. 1.8 billion tonnes and that actually produces close to 4 billion tonnes of carbon. It's 8% of global emissions. It's one of the single biggest causes of what we're talking about here. It's enormous. And it's one of those who are talking about at COP28, hard to abate sectors. It's the only hard to abate sector that has a clear pathway to nearly fully decarbonise. All the other sectors, it's difficult. So there is a pathway to do that. You know, my colleagues here have talked about that, but it requires a complete transformation of what has been an industry that has existed for 200 years. But four billion tonnes, now we're not going to change that overnight. You have to change each of the components. You have to change the inputs. You have to change the technology. And you have to actually change the energy sources.
but you have to bring all those together. And that actually is a transformation. So what our ambition is here, we represent nearly 50% of the Australian steel market. So 50%, it's a small market globally, but it's significant in Australia. If we achieve this, we singly as one group can decarbonise 50% of the Australian steel sector. That's enormous, that's an opportunity that we just can't resist. But you actually have to, the mining, when you say why is mining relevant to decarbonisation? Because hematite, the old style or iron ore, you put into blast furnaces with coal, doesn't solve it. You have to have higher quality iron ore. It starts with the ore, whether we like it or not. You have to change the technology. But the check technology requires a different energy source. So each of those components. So we're effectively trying to rebuild or transform an industry to produce the product that we look up in the ceiling here. Steel is still going to be steel. It's still going to look the same. You're going to touch it, you're going to tap it, and it's no different. But the difference is, it's actually going to be low carbon. That's the fundamental difference. But to do that, we actually need to change every element of the supply chain. It sounds boring, but it actually is crucial. It can actually be done. But what you need to do, and I think Stefan actually talked about that, we can't as an organisation, as a company, you know, with Sanjeev's vision, we have a vision to be head of the industry by 20 years. So we have a vision to be carbon neutral globally by 2030. The biggest steel makers in the world are talking 2050. They want to be 30% by 2030. We want to be 100%. So we want to be the first mover. There are only two or three other organisations in the world who actually have this aspiration right now. They sit in Sweden. They actually sit in Germany. They actually sit in Canada. But no one else is talking about this. They're talking about modifying blast furnaces and taking a little bit of carbon out. They're all trying to solve for this but there's actually a very clear pathway here. So what unlocks this for us? It's not just the magnetite. The key thing that actually unlocks this, I'll go to the next page, actually is the level of government support. And the key thing here, and as you know, Stefan actually indicated, it's actually the support of the South Australian government that's actually facilitated this transformation. Because we've talked about iron making, we've talked about steel making, we've talked about iron ore, we've talked about hydrogen, we've talked about renewables. They're all a part of that ecosystem. The part we haven't talked about is scrap. To make steel going forward, you make it with two things, scrap, or high quality iron ore. Fortunately, we have scrap in Australia that you can use. We do that with our infrabuild business. We use 100% scrap in our steel making in Australia in our infrabuild business. But blast furnaces, and they use electric arc furnaces, blast furnaces, we don't use scrap. But so we can change our technology to use scrap. But scrap, there's not enough of it in the world. That's the problem. Scrap, there's not enough to run all of the electric arc furnaces just on that. So you, the other input is the high quality iron ore. How do you bring all this together? The, what's unlocked it, I said before, is the South Australian government. It's facilitated their commitment a number of years ago to actually invest in hydrogen as an industry as a jobs plan, actually unlocks this. There is so much conversation at COP28. There's a hydrogen conference in a city somewhere in the world every week. And they're all talking about how do we use hydrogen? 
The best use of hydrogen is actually at source. No one solved how you're going to ship hydrogen around the world economically or efficiently. You can put hydrogen and make ammonia. That's, that's proven technology, but it's nascent. Hydrogen, use that source, and for us, using that source to actually make green iron is the most effective way to actually use hydrogen. So you can do that where you have renewable technology or re and where you actually can access to the iron ore. So South Australia's commitment is extraordinary. They've committed to the largest electrolyzer, 250 megawatt electrolyzer <laughs> at Wyala. And that's the start of their journey. But that's an extraordinary level of commitment. The Australian Federal Government, with their hydrogen head start, that is another commitment that is actually extraordinary to drive this transition. So all a part of that, the government's role, they facilitate this. The other thing that the government can do, from our perspective, globally, governments are the single biggest procurer of steel. They're the single biggest procurer of cement because they have infrastructure spending. They actually have building. They actually have a, a major role to drive customers to green products. It doesn't matter what country we're talking about, that is actually a critical part of this as well. So the support of local government, the support of federal government, we're seeing what's happening with the IRA, we're seeing what's happening in Japan. They're all trying to solve for the same thing. How do you, the role of government is to unlock, to facilitate. It is then the role of investors to come along and partner with companies that are, that are going on this journey, government supporting it. And ultimately, you know, it's the customers, the customers who are demanding this product. So it's that full <coughs> ecosystem. And I think what we're doing at Wyala is putting all of those components together. It's not a dream. The electrolyzer has been announced. We are about to sign our Coltana solar farm. We've already committed to an electric arc furnace. We've already committed to expanding our mining. Every single element of that ecosystem that Stefan talks about is in place. But it's still, you're, you're rebuilding an industry to produce that piece of steel sitting in the ceiling that you tap and no one knows that it's any different. But it's actually low carbon. And I'll end up with, you know, that context. For every tonne of steel produced by blast furnaces, two to two and a quarter tonnes of carbon is emitted. This, tech, this process here, this ecosystem, will change that for every one tonne of steel produced, it'll be between 0.1 and 0.3. 70 to 90% reduction in carbon emissions for producing what is, as Sanjeev said, is actually not a product that's re reducing, that demand is going to grow by 30 to 50% globally. So it is possible, we have that opportunity, it is fundamental to modern society. So thank you very much. I'll just open up. If anybody would like to ask any questions, happy, I think, Sanjeev, Teens, or Stefan, happy to take any questions. Please. Uh, Rowan Foley from the Aboriginal Carbon Foundation. That sounds quite positive, what you're saying. That, that, that is good. Uh, I'm just wondering, if you do need to offset your carbon footprint, will you buy Australian carbon credits and will you buy Australian carbon credits from traditional owners, First Nations? So our plans, as, uh, as uh, Paul was explaining, will take our carbon footprint down from over two tonnes intensity per tonne of steel down to 0 0.2, 0 0.3. But you're right, that balance, that residual 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, whatever it is, is almost impossible to eradicate. So we will have to look at uh, offsets. We have our own offset programs, but we're open to all other opportunities also.
Hello, Hans van Leeuwen from the Australian Financial Review. Um, I was just wondering what the timeline on this is at the moment. Um, you, you've sort of indicated that things are, you know, shovels are going to ground and stuff. So when are we likely to see the first green iron rolling out of the end, other end of the process? Our, pl our plans are actually very much, you know, underway. And as I said, we've already um, committed to our EAF uh, upgrade at Wyala. So I would expect with all these aspects that we will be producing green steel, so green iron and then green steel, around 2027. And that will be, if I talked about those other countries, that will be in the first five in the world that actually will be at that point. Uh, thank you very much. I wasn't here for the beginning of the presentation, but I'm, my name is Dean Smith and I'm a Liberal Party Senator from Western Australia. Uh, what other locations in Australia are attractive to you and this particular model? James, if you... I think clearly the, um, for us, uh, we, we've got the iron ore and we've got the um, natural um, energy capability is all f interesting um, um, locations. I think the one that we are, interestingly enough, looking at is Geraldton in WA, which actually gives us a really good opportunity. Uh, you've got the iron ore there, you've got initially the natural gas uh, availability, and as I said in the, in, at the start, it is important that we actually start with natural gas and then transition to, to hydrogen. So there's a unique oppor opportunity in, in Geraldton. But we're also looking at places like Darwin. So there's a number of places, Darwin, even, even uh, Gladstone are, are opportunities that has some unique uh, benefit. Either it's the energy source or it's the iron ore. So all of those opportunities are being explored. So sticking with the Geraldton example, you would use the Geraldton port for export or you would look at Newport development? Uh, I mean, we are looking at the Okaji. So Okaji um, is, is being developed. Um, I think the question in our mind is whether Okaji will be fast enough, uh, because Okaji has been on on the table for a for a while. So, so, but obviously Okaji would be absolutely ideal uh, as a location, given all the port development and the plans there. But we also look at something which is more south from Geraldton if we have to start before the Okaji. So, I think I'll just add one thing: there is no shortage of magnetite in the world. The difference for Wyala is that it's ready right now. Every other magnetite development, and there are many being talked about around the world, every other development of magnetite will be five to 10 years away. What we have is the first move advantage. Because we've been mining away the overburden, it's, I don't need to call he, uh, hematite an overburden, but nonetheless, for 120 years, we've been removing hematite from our mines. You saw a picture of that mine earlier. These are the first mines uh, of iron ore in Australia. And for 120 years, we've been removing the hematite overburden. Below that, we have magnetite, so it's ready now. Any greenfield projects will take five to 10 years. So we can accelerate, we can be the first mover, but we are definitely looking at other opportunities for magnetite. And of course, WA is, is, is blessed with a lot of magnetite. It's just that it's expensive, it's difficult, it will take time to build the infrastructure, to do those very large CapEx projects. But the world has to decarbonize, not just based on Wyla. There will be many other opportunities around the world, and WA is definitely well placed for that. Colin Tate from um, Investment Magazine in Australia. Can you talk a bit about pricing, and in particular, the, the premium for green steel, presumably to the producer, uh, and, and how long that premium might last? Uh, and then also, for the customer, the end customer, are they paying a premium, or is, will this actually become a, um, uh, an equivalent price product to the current status? So, this is a very exciting topic. We are in the steel associations around the world still quite early, unfortunately, a little bit behind the train with defining the standards for the green steel and making it easier for the customers to actually adopt and start running in this area. However, there are some client associations who is really driving it forward. And also more uh, companies globally are adopting the SPTI targets which means that also clients naturally out of those targets start asking for more greener product, if it's steel, if it's cement, or, or the whole, whole part of the value chain. So we see uh, in Australia, there are some clients who, who really want us to support them improve their competitiveness against their competition. 
And this was uh, is really truly exciting with uh, with uh, conferences like COP, who brings this all up to surface, up to life. Um, so what I then would say, the speed of it, and and you asked the question, how long will there be a premium for it? Uh, I think we are going to see that for a long time because there are still, as heard before, a lot of steel companies trying to optimize the blast furnace technology and stay in the fossil territory. As long as there are players in the fossil territory, there will be premium for it. Now, there are uh, discussions in Asia where what is then green steel? Um, there are premiums starting to be paid for steel that has less than one ton emissions of CO2 per ton steel. In, uh, in Europe, we are between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5. In America, we are between 0 0.5 and 0 0.6. So there's a little bit different air levels in the world, how that is progressing. Uh, we would estimate within the next two to three years, uh, the market is really uh, exponentially growing for the green steel. Maybe, Stefan, I can add a bit. So I think this was a question, actually, uh, which we discussed a lot. That is it competition or regulation which will drive green iron and green steel? Or actually, just generally decarbonization. And I think it's a combination of both. Europe is obviously definitely leading the pack in terms of regulation. We have already a carbon tariff, let's say, in Europe, which is going to get more and more intense. So there is a cost to produce steel in Europe today based on coal already. And that cost will become higher and higher. So on the one side, you have regulatory push on basically paying for the carbon. And some countries like Europe are leading. But in terms of the customer now paying for this or paying a premium for it, that is going to come from certain sectors ahead of others. Now, it's, not, it's, it's actually quite an obvious answer. Which sectors are going to demand green steel first? Obviously, electric vehicles are going to demand green steel first, because that whole concept is based on decarbonizing that sector. So if the automotive goes to EVs, those EV producers are already willing to pay a premium for green steel. Similarly, if you talk about renewables, a wind farm producer, if the, the steel, which is the steel plate, which is going into a wind farm, if that's based on coal, that doesn't make any sense. He's going to be willing to pay a premium if his, if his steel plate is green. And then again, when governments specify, if governments are subsidizing renewables, which most countries still are, in, the, in that case, they will start specifying that your supply chain must be decarbonized. So the supply chain for renewables and automotive will be the first to lead in terms of this premium. And we're already seeing some of this come through. There's already contracts being signed in Europe where automotive is paying a premium for green steel. We are already seeing a premium for green plate, which we make in Poland, for example, which is being paid to the customer. So ultimately, this will be the biggest driver. Ultimately, the customer will pull, and they can actually make the biggest difference. But to begin with, countries like Europe and other places, and now, of course, in Australia as well with the Head Start program, countries which sort of penalize carbon will also play a key role in this transition. Thanks very much. Excellent presentations. Uh, Dan Zavatierov of Minerals Council of Australia. Uh, it's, it's really interesting to listen to this. And I think it's a really exciting project. Um, it's essentially a giant electrification process in terms of the decarbonisation, right? So um, I, I'm interested, Stefan, it's probably a question for you as the energy person. What, how much electricity in terms of terawatt hours will... Because Currently, the steelworks is essentially running on coal. It's an industrial heat process, so there's not a lot of electricity, I think, um, because it's not an EAF, as opposed to the, I think, those mini mills in Rudy Hill and, uh, and Laverton, Australia. They're still running, I believe. Um, essentially, you're going to build a giant mini mill of over a million tonnes of production, and it's, so it's a lot of electricity, but also electricity for the hydrogen production. To, for the processing of DR. So I'm just wondering, what is the, what, what's the electricity terawatt hours currently and what do you expect it to be once you're in full flow? Yeah, thank you for that question. So uh, the electricity infrastructure is one of really the key topic and also uh, why it's so important working closely together with authorities going forward. Uh, when you see uh, the industrial um, ecosystem being fully developed, we will be utilizing in the range of up to three terawatt hours in only one, one place in, in, in Wyala. Um, if we were further to explore also for uh, export, it will also grow even further. That is also not something that the local grid is, is managing. And therefore, we need local production at site. And we're starting with a 280 megawatt uh, 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 pr production of PV. Uh, there is a lot of uh, wind uh, also being uh, explored. 
west of Adelaide, and there's further PV up north uh, uh, that is required to actually feed in the full system going forward. Um, but I must say, being uh, inside the energy industry for, for a long time, there are very few places that could even be close to competing to the South Australian uh, place with the port and the available land and the infrastructure to actually enable this. Uh, but you're on the spot that any area where, where we not need to develop this needs to have the right prerequisites on the infrastructure because normally that takes a lot of money and a lot of time, permit process, etc., to develop. And just a minor follow-up. Um, I'm assuming that the demand profile of the operations will be pretty uniform throughout the day and throughout the year. So it's, as you say, three terawatt hours and per annum, reasonably spread throughout the day. Like, you're not, are you going to be expecting lots of peaks and troughs? Or so that's a, a, also an, another business USP we are developing. Um, as any system is going over the 65% of renewables, the volatility goes up very, very high, and, and base industry are particularly hurt from that. Um, so we are developing our business, and electric arc furnaces has a better ability to also uh, shift, uh, as well as when you're producing hydrogen and have small intermediate storages, both in the pipeline but also in tanks, you are able to actually go with the flow uh, you can, however, not be fully dependent on PV, and that's why we, we heard, you know, the combination of PV and wind takes you over the 50% range. That's where we now then, with this, this ability to balance and firming up the whole system, we will find a good way to operate on commercial terms. Okay, thank you. It's, if I could just add there, it's the reason why, yeah, in our view going forward, you're seeing a bifurcation of, of historical steelmaking going forward. So historically, you had just end steel making is close to the end markets. You had iron making, which is principally what blast furnaces are, close to the end markets. What you're going to see going forward is because you're going to see a bifurcation of that supply chain. You're going to see steel making stay likely closer to the market, to the end user. But the iron making, which will become a, the critical input to that, actually now will gravitate fundamentally to where you have both available and cheap energy sources from a renewable perspective. And that's the fundamental, that splitting up of that supply chain. Wyala, we've talked about. Geraldton, we've talked about. But you know, it's why the UAE is, is an obvious place as well because of the vast renewable capacity actually here. So we're looking at not just what we're doing in Australia, because that, that underwrites everything that we're doing, but we're also fundamentally, we're, we're steel makers with significant operations in Europe, and the challenge for Europe is the energy. So you're going to see is a conversion of that, and you're going to be bringing um, DRI, you're going to be bringing the green iron from where it can be produced economically and, re and with renewable energy exported into Europe. It'll be green, and that's where the UAE it presents a great opportunity as well. You know, we're not naive to think that we can do it all just in one country. This is a complete change of that, of that supply chain. Can I just, I just want to add one more thing. You asked about Laverton and Rudy Hill. I think it's important to differentiate electric arc furnace and a DRI plant. Electric arc furnace is the consumer. It's the consumer who is going to make steel. That can be in Laverton or in Rudy Hill, or it can be in, you know, in Europe, it can be anywhere in the world. And that consumes electricity, and it can consume renewable energy directly, especially based on the new technologies. But it's a fraction of the amount of energy which is needed to make iron. Iron today is made from coal in a blast furnace. That is what hydrogen is replacing. Hydrogen is replacing the production of iron, and the electric arc furnace is replacing the production of steel, which can be done at destination where the iron can be made close to the energy. Well, thank you. Thank you very, all of you, very much. Thank you.